Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please, let's put our hands together for our God. Let's put our hands together for Jesus. Let's put our hands together for our apostle. Let's put our hands together for Pastor Mary. Amen. Also, let's put our hands together for our praise team. Can I get an amen? I just wanted to say, uh, Brother Mike, you're a trooper. You've been with us for many, many years through the ups and the downs. So it's always a pleasure that you're still playing the drums. He's a good saxophonist. You already know that he plays a saxophone, but we're also getting a taste of his skills on the drums as well. You're a good drummer as well, Mike, so God bless you. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. Thank you for the gift of health. Thank you for a sane mind. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your presence in every aspect of our lives. Father, if it was not for you in our lives, some of us may not be standing. Myself, for sure, I would not be here. So, Father, the fact that we're standing is a reason for us to come and glorify your holy name. And we pray, Lord, that even as we congregate together on this day, Pastor's Apostle Appreciation Day, we pray that your presence come down and touch all of us that are here. We pray, Lord, that everything will go according to plan. We pray also that our apostle will be honored the way he deserves to be honored. We thank you for his life. We thank you for his leadership. We thank you, Lord, for his mentoring. We thank you for his faith because he is un unwavering in his faith. And that has been an example for us that no matter what the enemy brings, it cannot overcome us because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. So we thank you for today. We pray, Lord, that even as we get into the word, we pray, Lord, that you, Lord, would take control of my thoughts, take control of my actions and my speech, so that everything that comes out of me is coming from you, because I recognize that my imagination cannot deliver anyone, it cannot heal anyone, but it is the presence of the Holy Spirit that can do those things. So we're asking for your spirit to come down and be in this place, direct our thoughts and our speech, so that everything that we say glorifies your holy name. Amen. We give you the praise, we give you the glory. We also pray, Lord, for anybody that is here who woke up this morning and purposed to go to church because they had a prayer need, because the Spirit told them that if you come to church today, you'll be prayed for and you shall be delivered. We pray for that person, whoever it is, that today they shall receive their breakthrough so that when they leave here, they shall be glorifying your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. All these things we ask and we pray in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said... Amen, amen. Put your hands together. Let's give God the praise. Now you may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon promise just to know the same the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him over and more Jesus Jesus pray Jesus, Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple Faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you, how I've proved you over and more. Jesus, Jesus. Precious, 
Yes, Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust Him more. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How I trust Him. How Jesus. We thank God for the gift of life. We thank God for the gift of health. We thank him for a sane mind. We thank him for his grace because it has been sufficient for yours and my needs. We thank him for his mercies which are renewed every morning so that a sinner like I can come and repent and know that I will be forgiven. We thank him for the peace of God which indeed has surpassed our understanding. And I'm sure that if you have a relationship with Jesus, it has surpassed your understanding. Can I get an amen? amen? Because the stuff that you've had to go through, if it wasn't for Jesus in your life, you know that the place that you'd be in today would not be a good place. And for me especially, I know if it had not been for the Lord, I don't know where I'd be today. The title of my sermon today is, Is God Real? Now, the fact that you're in church today shows me that you already know that he's real. Amen. So we thank God for that. Hallelujah. Because there's a majority that's out there that is still struggling with that question. The majority is still struggling with that question. So when that day comes, even the Bible says so, when that day comes, there's a majority who won't go to heaven. And let me give you the reason why. Not because they were so evil, not because they were so sinful, but simply because they refused to receive Jesus in their lives as their Lord and Savior. For that reason alone, because the Bible says that nobody will come to God except those who come through his Son. So all those who are saying they don't believe in Jesus, all those who are discrediting you for being a Christian, they're going to end up in the other place. And unfortunately, they are the majority. So the reason why this is the subject of my word this morning, of the word this morning, is because when you look around us, you see a lot of people trying to discredit God. You see a lot of people trying to convince us that God does not exist. A lot of people wasting their breath, not only on television, but also online. And a lot of those online, by the way, a lot of people who present their opinion as being the gospel truth. A lot of people who write things and present them as being the opinion of the world. When in actual fact, it's their opinion. But when you read it, you think, well, if everybody thinks this, then it must be the gospel truth. And there's nothing further than that. You need to have discernment so that everything that you read on the internet, God can tell you whether it's truth or it's not. And majority of it is not truth. When I read news on the internet, it bothers me to see that there's a lot of people discrediting Christians. Like somebody writing a story, 20 reasons why Christians, or 20 reasons why Christianity is not for you. Those kind of posts are becoming regular. When I read the news today, I just want to turn it off. Because majority of it, all the news that you read on the internet, a lot of it is false. A lot of stuff that you hear on your WhatsApp group that people are sharing, a lot of it is false. Because people receive things and they share right away without verifying whether it's true or not. So whatever that is that's not true, it is rolling around out there and people are buying it. People are believing it. And the devil is happy. The devil is happy because he's getting a foothold. The devil is happy because Christians are seeing all that is going on and they're being quiet. And that is pleasing the devil. It disturbs me a lot because I'm a member of a number of groups, some of them Christian groups, family groups. There's a group for everything these days. But there's this group that I'm in 
And it's got a lot of knowledgeable Christians in it, even pastors. And these kind of debates and all these kind of discussions are going on in front of us, and nobody's saying anything. People are discrediting God. People are talking about the current conflict in the Middle East. And everybody's got an opinion. Everybody supports this one. Everybody supports that. And we're spending time on that. As if your opinion is going to change my opinion. As if my opinion is going to change yours. And we waste our time. The internet, as great as it is, as great as a research tool as it is, for me especially, it's also a big disappointment as well. Especially when it comes to the word of God. When you see people writing on how we're being bamboozled as Christians, we don't know any better. When in actual fact, you and I who have a relationship with God, we know better. Amen. Really, that's what it boils down to. People who don't have a relationship with God are going to try to discredit you that God does not exist. But if you have had an encounter with God, who can convince you that it's not real? And that is why it disappoints me a lot in a lot of places where I appear and people are talking about God, that the Christians are silent. And I'm one of the few who's speaking up. My last sermon here was stand for something. Stand for your faith. Stand for your faith or fall for anything. If somebody puts a gun to your head and tells you denounce Christ right now, what are you going to do? That's a good question because there's a lot of people who say, well, I still have many years to go. I don't need a bullet in my head right now. They might do what Peter did. It's interesting. I spoke about that a couple of weeks ago. And this morning I was listening to Christian radio, and that's exactly what they were discussing. That Peter saw Jesus at his prime. Peter saw Jesus at the height of his career, if you can call it that. Peter saw all the miracles that Jesus performed. Jesus, Peter knew that Jesus was the son of God. And if you're the son of God, there's nothing that is impossible for you. He saw that. He knew that. He had lived that. But yet when push came to shove, he denied Jesus three times. So I'm praying that today, if you're a blood-washed, spirit-filled Christian, that no matter what challenge st stands in front of you, no matter who is trying to discredit the Lord, no matter who is trying to convince you that you are delusional because you've accepted Jesus into your life as your Lord and Savior, that you just brush them off and say, I know the Lord, I see him, he's real in my life, I don't need to listen to you. Whatever you have to say has no bearing on my life. Why? Because I have a relationship and it's working for me. I don't need anyone to tell me anything else. So this is what I'm talking to you about. Is God real? Is God real to you? Are you willing to stand up for him when push comes to shove? Are you willing to put everything aside for our God? Is God the most important thing in your life? And unfortunately, for a lot of Christians, he's not. Because when push comes to shove, they'll do exactly what Peter did. So anyway, I thank God for an opportunity to stand here and bring the word. I thank God for our apostle who has been a great mentor for me. And it is not, it's not the most exciting thing to deliver the word in front of my mentor, if you can imagine. Because he'll be ticking off and he'll talk to me later. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I thank God for this opportunity. I don't take it for granted. I thank God for all the leaders in this church. I thank God for the praise and worship. Amen. Because this for me, every Sunday, allows me to communicate with God in the spirit. I pray every day. But when it comes to praise and worship, there's something that happens in between us and God that you cannot replace with anything else. So I appreciate the praise and worship in this church. Because the church that, I, you know what, you're, I'm sorry, you're going to get tired of me talking about that church. But I have to make these comparisons. And I have to make them all the time. If you look around and you see our numbers and you think, 
Well, I heard that everybody went to the Methodist church. You know what? Maybe everybody went there, but maybe the spirit of the Lord is not there. The church that I came from, and I'm going to mention it again, it was 2,000 people per city, three services every Sunday. 6,000 people went through those doors. But none of us got a chance to worship. Because they had a nice choir, awesome church, everything nice, a reason for you to go to church. Even the ushers and everybody, wow, coffee, donuts, pastries every Sunday, you know, very prosperous, very thriving church. 2,000 people per sitting. You imagine how many people. But when it comes time to worship, you could count maybe five people standing up to worship out of 2,000. Five people worshiping God. And we are looking at them and saying, who do these people think they are? Do they think they're more anointed than the rest of us? We didn't know anything. 2,000 of us knew nothing. And then I joined a small church. And that's when I found out what worship was. And that's when my life was transformed. And that's when God started doing things in my life that I will always be grateful for. And that's why I want to encourage you that the presence of the Lord is in this church. Don't look around and say, well, every so often I see some empty chairs. That has no bearing on the presence of the Lord. The presence of the Lord is you, your spirit. What is it that brought you? If you came to worship God, then the presence of God will be here. If you came because it was some kind of a, 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 a ritual that was passed down into your family, but you yourself don't have a relationship with the Lord, then it's not working for you. You're one of those who's teetering on the fence. Meaning somebody will tell you something about Christians and you'll buy it and you'll fall on the other side. And there you go. And the Lord says that if you become lukewarm, I'd rather you were hot or you were cold. If you're cold, I know where you are. If you're hot, I know where you are. If you're lukewarm, you don't know where you are. I don't know you. You'll be one of those people Jesus was talking about in Matthew 7. You'll come to me saying, Lord, Lord, I do this in your name. And the Lord will tell you, I didn't know who you were. So get away. You know, when we get to heaven... There's people who will find there who will be surprised that they made it. Be thankful that you made it. Because there's people who will be missing there that you'll be saying, what, Bishop isn't here, what happened? You know, there's a lot of Christians who will not make it. So let us take the time, because time is short. If you look around, you'll see that a lot of prophecies in the Bible are becoming a reality today. A lot of things that are happening today have already been prophesied. They've already been spoken about in the Bible. And they're becoming a reality. What does that mean? It means that these are the end times, my friends. When people are fighting each other, brother is fighting brother. Blood is fighting blood. These are the end times. Incidentally, who is it that passed away a couple of days ago? Was it yesterday? Who passed away? Somebody important. Somebody. Matthew Perry. From Friends. You know Matthew Perry. So he passed away. What happened? He uh, he's drowned or something. What does that mean? It means tomorrow is not promised to anyone. He had money. He had everything that you would want. He had fame. Lived in a nice house. But look at what happened. He drowned. He didn't know that. If he knew he was going to drown, he'd have stayed away from that swimming pool. But he didn't know. Who knows? Your life could end tomorrow. So you don't have the time. You don't have the luxury of saying, well, let me decide later on what I think about Jesus. It's time to make that decision now. Because you don't know what, what tomorrow will bring. Can I get an amen on that? You don't know. We have to go to the word of God. Forgive me, I was getting carried away. But the word of God this morning is coming from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 from verse 1 to verse 24. And if you'd rise, please, as we read the word of God. That is our custom in our church. When we read the word of God, we stand up. 
give him the glory. So this is the word of God. It says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, faint -hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourself and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your, holy, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. That is the word of the Lord. May he add his grace and his mercy to it. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. So, some time back, I heard a story about a Christian band, a very popular Christian band. I'm sorry, I forget the name. But their leader... The leader of this Christian rock group one day made an announcement. He said, I've come to the conclusion that God is not real. This is somebody who has been the front man for a very popular group. They've been performing everywhere. They've been leading people into the presence of the Lord. They've been doing the work of God, and God has been blessing them. And then one day he decides, he makes an announcement that I've decided that God is not real. So from today, I'm not doing this anymore. Now that really puzzled me. Even up to today, it puzzles me. I wish I could have had a chance to speak to him and find out what could have made him come to a conclusion like that. Because as far as you and I know, those of us who have a relationship with the Lord, that once we saw a miracle in our lives, that we would never look back. Can I get an amen on that? How many of you have seen a miracle in your life? Let me see you the show of hands. How many of you have seen a miracle and you know beyond a reasonable doubt that if it was not for God, this would have ended badly? Let me see again with the show of hands. How many? Now, if you haven't seen a miracle in your life, you need to go back to the drawing board. You need to come forward so we can pray together. So that the Holy Spirit can direct your life. Because miracles are for everybody. Can I get an amen? amen? It's not good enough for you to say that I'm a praying person and I've never seen a miracle. That's not good enough. You're not praying enough. You need to pray harder. Why? Because our Lord said that each one of us, when we pray in faith, we shall receive our breakthrough. So if you haven't seen a miracle in your life, then something is wrong. Because if you're a praying person, you need something to happen that will encourage you. Can I get an amen on that? You need to see something with your own eyes so that nobody can convince you that God is not real. 
Otherwise, when they're having these discussions on the internet, you'll be one of those who'll be questioning. Is that real? Could that be? Hmm, maybe I've been thinking wrong all these years. When in actual fact, if you've had an encounter with God, nobody can tell you anything. If you've seen with your own eyes what God can do, and you've seen with your own eyes what he has done, nobody can tell you anything. As a matter of fact, you're the one who needs to have something to say. And this is why I'm talking to you about this. Because I've seen with my own eyes that when topics like this are coming up, Christians are quiet. Don't you have proof that God is real? Don't you have something to say in defense of our God? Are you ashamed of him? He said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you in front of my father. That's the worst thing that could happen to anyone, that Jesus is ashamed of you. But the way some of us act, he has no choice but to be ashamed of some of us. Because when push comes to shove, we're quiet. Why? Because we're scared of offending someone. I'm not, a, I'm not scared of offending you if I'm defending my God. Can I get an amen? amen? If I'm defending my God, I'm not scared to offend you. Why? Because I know I'm pleasing him. And he's the most important person I need to please, not men. Men will let you down every time. But God is faithful. God is not a man that he should lie. Whatever he told you he's going to do, he's going to do. I guarantee you that. So please, whenever we're faced with questions about God, is he real? When, you know, and, you're gonna f and I'm going to read you some, some, some comments that I read, read recently on WhatsApp that got me all riled up. And it raises the question again, so where does God come from? It's not only inquisitive children who've asked this age-old question. People of all ages and stages in life have pondered the origins of God and wondered how he came to exist. Before the beginning of time as we know it, where was God and what was he doing? Was he actually created or did he spontaneously appear? These questions and many others about God's origins have baffled people everywhere, both the religious and the non-religious alike. Do we know where he came from? If we see the tangible benefits of having a relationship with him, does it even matter where he came from? If you see the tangible benefits of having a relationship with God in your life, does it even matter where he came from? Those who don't have a relationship with him are trying to say that it matters because you can't prove you don't know where he came from. Why are you following a myth? You know, it's like those who tell you that Christianity is a white man's religion. I've heard that said, especially by Africans. I don't need that. That's a white man's religion. Well, whenever I hear that, I ask them. I'm the kind of person I have to worship a god. I'm not the kind of person, I'm not an atheist at all. I'm not an atheist by any shred of imagination. I'm the kind of person I have to worship a god. So since Jesus is a white man's god, can you advise me? Can you recommend a god that I can worship? Maybe an African god. Can you recommend a god that I can worship but I have some conditions. He must be a God that speaks to me. He must be a God that hears my prayers. He must be a God that shows up in my life. Those are my conditions. Can you recommend someone? Silence. Silence. Now, if you can't recommend a God to me, then why are you trying to discredit this God that I serve? This God who appears to me, this God who blesses me, this God who answers my prayers, why do I have to listen to you? And you don't have a clue. You're ignorant. That's the problem, is that ignorant people are trying to convince us to follow what they believe. But they're trying to convince us to follow them into hell. And I'm trying to tell you that it's time for us to have our own relationship with God. And it's time for us to stand up for him. Because he died for you and I. Imagine that. The Son of God died for you and I. Yet when push comes to shove, we're embarrassed to say that I'm a Christian. When push comes to shove, I'm embarrassed to say 
that as for me and my household, we'll always serve the Lord. When push comes to shove and people are discussing Christ, we're the ones who are not saying anything. And they rat on us and they accuse us of everything, call us everything under the sun, and we just stay there and keep quiet. Well, I'm not one of those who's going to keep quiet. Because I see what God has done in my life, and as a result, I'm going to tell you what he has done for me. Now, as I was saying, and I'm going to try to keep this short because we have a lot of activities today. But in one of my WhatsApp groups where we have all these anointed people, we have all these spirit-filled, blood-washed people, this was the discussion that was going on. This was somebody who I respect, somebody who has a lot of pull in the community. And these were his views. It says, according to multiple scholars, the Bible was written about by 40 different people, beginning with the Jewish prophet Moses. The overall consensus, however, is that the Bible was written by men, each making contributions according to their particular time, situation, interpretation, and need. There is even a third testament that was prepared within the last 200 or so years, and the Mormons have their own take of this book. Interestingly, there are numerous differences between the Bible and the Torah, and the Israelites currently at war in Palestine do not even believe in the second half of the Bible. In other words, they're not Christians. There are also many scholars who say much of the Bible we see today was actually written during the last 1,000 years by various Greek and Latin scholars who interpreted the original Hebrew scripts, scripts to suit their particular needs of the day. The King James Version took this even further. However, what every single scholar agrees upon is that not one word of the Bible was written by an African, a Japanese, a Chinese, an, our, an Aborigine, or even an American Indian. We Africans are truly the most gullible people in the world. After reading that, my blood was hot. But I let it go. And there's more comments. Also interesting to note, this is by somebody else who has agreed. Also interesting to note that God's chosen people murdered his son and refused to recognize the Trinity. Is it possible that there are actually two gods? A seriously powerful, militant, and malicious one for the Israelis and a different one for the rest of us. My blood was getting hotter. This was somebody else's response. It is a possibility. I do not think that our God would deem us inferior and support oppressors. But then the Bible is questionable. Who wrote it, by the way? Now, we've got Christians who are watching all this and they're keeping quiet. I mean, I'm not the one to tell you you need to have to say something. But me, when it comes to my faith, and somebody is talking about my faith like that, I can't help it. I have to jump in. And this was my response. Whether it was the right one or not, God help me. But I had to say something. I want to address some undertones of atheism in what I'm reading. When you've witnessed the hand of God in your life, it doesn't matter to you who thinks what about him. There's a big move these days to eliminate God from our lives, from those who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. You can't convince someone who has a working relationship with God and who receives tangible benefits from him that God does not exist. If I've witnessed a miracle, a miracle which is a move of God, if I've witnessed a move of God in my life, you can discredit the Bible all day. But it won't change what I saw with my own two eyes. As long as the joy of the Lord and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding are tangible things in my life and are the basis for this good life that I'm living, why should it matter to me what, what anybody else thinks? Or why they spend so much time trying to convince us that we're delusional. In my life, God is real and he is a fact. What he has done is reality to me. It doesn't matter to me that some people have sold their souls. I'm going to be one of those saints who are marching in. And that was the end of that discussion. That was the end of that discussion. That was maybe a week ago. Nobody touched it. 
Nobody touched it because they saw somebody who was willing to stand up. Amen. And I'm willing to be in your face. Why? Because I know that the God is real. Amen. And I know that he's blessing me for supporting him. So I'm going to support him. When people are ragging on him, when people are discredited, I'm going to be the one who's going to support him. And I don't care what anybody thinks. Because I only care what one person thinks, and that is God himself. Can I get an amen? amen. They can think whatever they want to think. But all I'm concerned about is what God thinks. Because what God thinks is what makes my life real. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, in this day and time, as I mentioned, that there's a move, a certain group trying to eliminate God from our lives simply because the word of God disagrees with their lifestyle. Somebody was quoting the, a Bible scripture in a public meeting, and there was this cry there was people who were discrediting him. They said he was using hate speech. Now, this is where we've come. That I'll be in a public forum and I'll quote the word of God and somebody will say that is hate speech. Since when did the word of God become hate speech? This is the world that we live in. What are you doing as a Christian? When people are talking like this about your God, what are you doing? Are you just observing and say, well, I don't want to bother anyone. I don't want to offend anyone. Let me just keep that to myself. You know, God is watching. God gave up his life. Our Lord Jesus gave up his life for you. And you're not even willing to stand up for him. When he comes back, are you seriously going to be considered for citizenship in heaven? If you're not even concerned to stand up for him. The truth about God's origins is that he has existed for all eternity. No one created him, nor did he spontaneously appear on the scene. To be sure, this thought is far beyond our scope of understanding. However, the Bible explains in Romans chapter 11, 33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his path beyond our beyond tracing out so even though god's paths are beyond our comprehension we shouldn't view this as a discouragement but instead be comforted in knowing that our eternal god is the same yesterday today and forever according to hebrews 13:8 not only has the lord always existed but we can also depend on him who knows us he loves us and wants us to spend eternity with him. Now, as I'm winding up, in the 17th century, a famous philosopher and mathematician called Pascal, he encouraged people to make a wager when it came to belief in God. If a person chose to believe in God, and God did exist, that person would gain everything, called eternal life. If a person chose to believe in God, and God did not exist, that person would lose nothing. On the other hand, if a person chose not to believe in God and he was right, he would lose nothing. But if that person did not believe in God and he was wrong, he would lose everything. And for sure, he'd lose his eternal life. So based on this logic, Pascal suggested that the rational person should choose to believe in God. As believing offers a person everything called eternal life, while losing nothing. Wherever you are in your faith journey, would you consider taking Pascal's wager? If the good God of the Bible exists, you have nothing to lose and everything to gain by believing in him today. So put it another way, it is better to go through life believing in God and get to the end of it to discover that he does not exist than to go through life not believing that he exists and get to the end of it only to find out that he does. Now those of, the, those of us who believe in the Lord, if he wasn't real, we're still getting benefits. I don't know where those benefits are coming from if he's not real. Right? We're getting benefits. Can I get an amen? Are you getting benefits? Yeah. Right? You're getting benefits from your relationship with God. Right? If he was not real, where would those benefits be? Would you be getting them? So do you know in your heart that God is real? Do you know without a single doubt that God is real? That no matter what anybody tells you, they cannot convince you otherwise.
Can I get an amen on that? So when people are talking about God like this, where are you? When people are talking about God like this, where are you? As I'm wrapping up, life can truly feel overwhelming for everyone. Which is why people often choose prayer, or simply put, a conversation with God, to ask for hope, strength, guidance, or circumstantial change in difficult times. Putting it in God's hands when we're facing any number of obstacles can provide great comfort and peace in a world that we know is out of control. The Bible teaches us that prayer is powerful and effective, both in communicating with God and in bringing peace to those who pray. We consider it an honor to be able to talk personally with God, who created us with confidence that he listens and he cares. So you and I who have seen the hand of God in our lives, those of us who pray and will see results, it doesn't matter what anybody else will say about God. You and I know that we will serve him for the rest of our lives. Can I get an amen on that? We will never backslide. My prayer is for you that you'll never backslide because many have. So it's not impossible. I'm just puzzled that it even happens, especially after you've had an encounter with God. How do you backslide? What is it that is that powerful that can cause you to backslide after you've had an encounter with God? What is that? And what was it that caused people to backslide? What was it that caused that Christian band leader to backslide? We need to pray against it. Why? Because we have seen the hand of God in our lives. We don't want that to happen. And when you backslide, let me tell you, your wife, your life will be the worse for it. Because how do you accept Jesus and then dump him? There's repercussions for that. Receive Jesus in your life and then dump him just because you felt it, just because somebody convinced you that you should. And you dump him, there will be repercussions. You don't want to do that. So let us embrace the possibility that the God of the Bible really did create the world and really does care for you. However many billions of people pray every night to him, he still has the time to hear your prayer. Can I get an amen on that? Thank you, Jesus. However many billions are praying in Jesus' name, he has time to hear your prayer. So for those who are trying to discredit God, are wasting, they're wasting their time trying to preach to us because we are sold on Jesus for life. Amen. So here are some basic proofs. Basic, there's millions of proofs that God exists. But here are some basic ones, some very basic ones. Is your faith based on evidence or is it blind faith? God has given Christians vital and encouraging proofs that he exists and that he has a plan for mankind. Number one, creation demands a creator. See, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. Number two, life demands a life giver. Scientists have tried in vain to create life from non-life. Even from soups of laboratory chemicals, they have utterly failed. There's only one person who is the giver of life. That is God. Proof number three, laws demand a lawgiver. James chapter 4 verse 12 says, yes, the creator God is the lawgiver, both of natural law and spiritual law. The Lord is our Lord giver. Number four, design demands a designer. Not only do we find predictable physical laws throughout the universe, we find tremendous evidence of intelligent design. The human body, for example, shows insurmountable evidence of design that can only be from God. No man can create a human. Can I get an amen on that? Yes. Number five, fulfilled prophecy. Hundreds of prophecies given thousands of years ago have been fulfilled, are right now being fulfilled, and will be fulfilled in the years soon to come. Yes. Number six, answered prayer. If you're a praying person, God is answering your prayers. You don't need any other proof. 
You don't need any other proof. If you're a praying person and God is answering your prayers, you don't need any other proof. That's it. That's all you need. Who can convince you otherwise? Finally, it's a way of life that works. The way of man brings about death, not life. But there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's Proverbs 14, 12. But there is a way of life that works. That way is revealed in the Bible. As the Messiah Jesus Christ proclaimed, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the Bible challenges you to live the way of life, not the way of death. God's way of life produces abundant living and true peace, not death and destruction. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So as I wind up, Perhaps the greatest challenge to all human beings is found in the book of Isaiah, where it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the right, unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. May the great creator of the universe and his son, Jesus Christ, help you to prove his existence and to find the true way of life. Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen. let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you, Lord, for confirming that you are God, that we see your presence in our lives every day. Help us to be bold about our faith. Help us to be bold about what we believe in. Help us to stand for you. Help us to boldly stand for you. No matter what is being said around us, no matter what is going on around us, help us to be bold for you. Help us to be strong for you. Help us to stand for you, no matter what is going on around us. And we pray, Lord, that you see each one of us, that even as we put you first, even as we ask forgiveness for our sins, even as we ask for your input in our lives, we pray, Lord, that we may live the kind of lives that make you happy. We pray, Lord, that we may do the things that you want us to do. We pray, Lord, that you may take control of our thoughts and our actions and our speech and everything that we do so that we may live the kind of lives that make you happy. Because we know that if we can make you happy, it shall be well with us. We pray, Lord, that whenever we're involved in discussions, where people are questioning your existence. We pray that you'll give us wisdom, that we'll just say one thing that will shut them all up. Wherever people, Lord, are discrediting you, wherever people are discrediting the Bible, wherever people are convincing some to backslide, we pray, Lord, that you'll use us to be the voice of reason. We pray that you'll use us, Lord, to speak up so that any damage that is being done to the kingdom, that we may alleviate it, that we may end it. And that all those who are being misled, that, Father, their eyes will open and they'll see the truth. And the truth being that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is what we believe, that you, O oh God, are real. And we pray for more of your presence. We pray for more of your spirit. We, may for, we pray for more of your power in our lives, in everything that we do so that you may be pleased with us. And as you're pleased with us, may it be well with us. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. All these things we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Now, just thank you. I'd like to invite you real quick. If you don't have a relationship with God, I just want to pray for you real quick that today our God will touch you, that if you haven't come into that understanding, if you haven't come into that relationship that you need with him, that today he'll reach down and touch you. Heavenly Father, we pray for all those who have not completely accepted you, who have not completely given their lives to you. We pray today that you will touch them. We pray that today all of us will receive your spirit and that we shall hold on to you for the rest of our lives. We pray, Lord, that you come into our lives Take control of our thoughts. Take control of our actions. Take control of our speech. Take control of everything that we do so that our actions may please you, so that our lives may be pleasing unto you. 
We pray, Lord, that we may live the kind of lives that encourage you to write our names in your book. Because, Lord, when that time comes, we want to be amongst those that you're coming for. We don't want to be left behind. We thank you, Lord. We give you the praise. We give you the glory. All these things we ask and we pray in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. amen. Now, join me. Let's put our hands together. Let's give God the praise. Because he deserves it. He deserves it. He's an awesome God. He's a wonderful God. Uh, just a quick hallelujah. announcement. There's food served after the service. So don't be in a rush. Stay so that you can break bread after the service. Now we're going to invite our apostle to come up and we're going to pray over him. Amen. So we're going to invite the apostle. Pastors, please join me. Let us circle him. Pastor Frank. And the rest of us, let us hold our hands out towards him as we pray. We thank you, Lord, our God, for our apostle. We thank you, our Lord, for bringing us to this church. Father, even as I mentioned earlier, I didn't know what true praise was until I joined this church. So we thank you, Lord, that we can come into this building and worship you with abandon. Worship you like the world is ending today. And not worry about what anybody else thinks. We thank you, Lord, that you blessed us with our apostle that he has the kind of faith that he has. Lord, when I joined this church 22 years ago, I was looking for a man of God who had faith. And when I sat down with him, I realized this was the man of God that I was looking for. And so we thank you, Lord, because his faith is unwavering. We thank you, Lord, because his dedication to you is unwavering. We thank you, Lord, because he's not compromising on the word of God. And we pray, Lord, that he will never, ever compromise on it. We pray that in this church, Almighty God, your presence is going to come down. Because, Father, when your presence is not here, then nobody wants to come. But when your presence is here, then everybody wants to come. So we pray, Lord, for your presence in this church. We pray, Lord, that you support our apostle, honor his stand for you. Father, he's not had an easy go of it. There are other apostles and pastors who have had an easier time. But the struggle that he has been through, Almighty God, we're praying that that struggle will end today in Amen. Jesus' name. We pray that the desires of his heart will be answered today in Jesus' name. His desire, Lord, is to serve you. His desire, Lord, is to plant churches. His desire is for these churches to prosper. And so we're praying, Lord, that you'll honor that desire, that you'll anoint him, that he'll plant churches everywhere, that Christ's citadel will be everywhere, and that, Father, you shall enable him Enable him to lead this church the way you want it to be led, so that it shall grow, so that it shall prosper. We pray that you'll give him wisdom. We pray, Lord, that you'll comfort him every time he's disappointed. Because, Father, your flock sometimes, they can be a disappointment sometimes. But we pray that he won't take that to heart. We pray, Lord, that he'll keep his eye focused on you and that in everything that he does, that you, O oh God, will receive the glory and the honor. We pray for him and his family. We pray that the blood of Jesus is covering them. We pray that they're surrounded with the hedge of pro your hedge of protection. We pray against any accident. We pray against any incident, any emergency, any issue that will rob them of their peace and their joy. We pray today that you'll cover them with the blood of Jesus, that no assignment of the enemy will succeed. We pray that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will be their portion. We pray that the joy of the Lord, which is abundant in your presence, is their portion. And we pray that they will be happy in their lives. Father, this work is not easy, and many have left, many have quit. But we pray, Lord, that you surround him with your presence, that no matter what the enemy tries to do, he'll only focus on you and answer only to you, O oh God. So we pray that you have your way in him, have your way in his family. Have your way in this church. We pray that the rest of us will support his vision. And we pray that this church will thrive. We pray that all those who have left will come back in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you'll anoint all the leaders and give them wisdom on what to say so that everybody will come and back and worship you in this place. So have your way, Lord, today. And all that are under the sound of his voice. We pray that they will be blessed. We pray that every prayer that he prays over them will be answered. You said in the word 
that the elders will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We pray that every person that he prays for will recover 100% and that your name will be glorified. So have your way in this place. Have your way in his life. We thank you for him. We pray that every prayer will be answered. All his needs, all the personal needs, we pray that they shall be answered. And now we're praying also for his wants, that those wants will be answered as well, so that he will see the hand of God in his life wherever he looks, so that he'll feel the presence of God wherever, whenever he wakes up, he'll feel the presence of God in his life, and that he will know that, Father, you're one of his favorites. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for his life. We pray today, Lord, that you will bless him and his family, and in all that they do, May you, our God be glorified. All these things we ask and we pray in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen, 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 amen. Thank you. Apostle, I know you want to say a word, so let's give you an opportunity to say a word. Praise God.